going to share with you is nothing more than what the scripture says. And I know you're not tired of hearing that. <laughs> the Apostle Paul, in writing to the church at Corinth, defined the gospel as this. Christ died for our sins, according to the scriptures, and was buried and rose again the third day, according to the scriptures. The church received this message, preached to them, and they were standing in it, and by it, they were being saved. This message has not changed. It is ever living and still has the power to save everyone who believes and holds on to it. The gospel is given many appellations. Mark called it the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Jesus came preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God. It is the word of the Lord. It is the gospel of Christ, the gospel of God, the gospel of the grace of God. It is the preaching of the cross, the gospel of peace, and the glad tidings of the kingdom of God, glad tidings of good things, the gospel of your salvation, the power of God unto salvation to everyone who believes, and it is the everlasting gospel. Even that was proclaimed in heaven. Just in rehearsing these names, we can see the great magnitude of God's love and grace to men, that he would send his only begotten son to retrieve a fallen race and bring those who believe to himself. The gospel is universal in that it is for all mankind. Before there was any distinction between men, the gospel was preached in embryo form to the first man who had sinned and plunged the entire race into alienation from God. But God did not destroy the race. He had respect to the work of his hands. In his infinite wisdom, he would send his son as the savior of the world. In the garden, God said to the serpent, I will put enmity between thy seed and her seed, which is Christ. It shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. The gospel was preached to Abraham before he was circumcised to show that God would justify not only the Jew, but also the heathen through faith. The gospel was preached to those in the wilderness, Paul said. They all drank of the spiritual rock that followed them, and that rock was Christ. The good news to that generation was God's promise of entering into rest. But many did not enter in because of their unbelief and the hardness of their hearts. And it was after our Lord's resurrection that the gospel was opened to the world. Jesus' final charge to his disciples was, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. There are no cultural or ethnic boundaries, no station in life, be it high or low, young or old, rich or poor, to whom the gospel does not apply and all are accountable to it. There are things that accompany the gospel when it is received into a good and honest heart. Power comes, power to become the sons of God, even to those that believe on Christ's name. Repentance and baptism come along with the reception of the gospel, as does the knowledge of sins forgiven by the cleansing blood of Jesus Christ we realize that God's wrath is no longer upon us, but instead we have peace with God. There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. And the God of hope fills us with all joy and peace in believing that we may abound in hope through the power of the Holy Spirit the Spirit also sheds the love of God abroad in our hearts. And all these things we absolutely need because afflictions accompany the belief of the gospel. Persecutions of varying degrees will arise and strivings with an unredeemed flesh we will always war against as long as we are in this world. 
but God has given us means, means to stand through all of these things and make us more than conquerors through him that loved us. With regard to God, the gospel declares the absolute righteousness and justice of God in justifying the ungodly. From the first man until now, all have sinned and are coming short of the glory of God. None have obtained to God's righteousness, none who are before the law, and none who came after the law. But through God's grace and forbearance, through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus and faith in his blood, righteousness is imputed or counted to us who believe. This is a blessed condition indeed. Amen. Blessed are they whose iniquities are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Amen. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord will not impute sin. Amen. Amen. Not only those who have the faith of the Lord Jesus Christ are blessed, but also God is blessed. And for want of a better word, the happy, the happy God. Now, we're not talking about happiness in a surface way, not happiness that depends on one's circumstances. I remember the first time this was preached to me, that God is the blessed God, the happy God. I had not thought of him in those veins before that time but he is. One man said the, the blessedness or happiness of God is the solemn, calm, restful, perpetual gladness that fills the heart of God. Even the Jews considered God as blessed, at least in their doctrine. The high priest at Jesus' trial asked him, Art thou the Christ, the Son of the blessed? And he answered, I am. God is blessed within himself. It is part of his nature, and it is part of his nature to give of his blessedness. God richly provides us with everything to enjoy, Paul wrote to Timothy, and he still is. Even to the Greeks on Mars Hill, Paul proclaimed that the God who made the world gives to all mankind life and breath and all things. But God gave the ultimate gift. He gave his only begotten son. Paul wrote to Timothy of the gospel of the glory of the blessed God. What God has communicated to us in the gospel is this glory. We see his glory in the face of Jesus Christ, in his death, burial, and resurrection. John said that when the word was made flesh and dwelt among us, we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. The light of the glory of, the, of God shone from him when as a gentle shepherd he had compassion on the ignorant and those that were out of the way, when he healed all who came to him for healing, and when he taught the multitudes about the kingdom of God. His glory shone when he confronted his enemies with truth, it's shown in the garden when he said to the Father who had sent him for this purpose, not my will, but thine be done. He submitted to the deepest cruelty of the Jews and the Roman government, even though he had all power in heaven and earth to call legions of angels to destroy his enemies and rescue him. God's wrath against sin was poured out upon him as the sacrificial lamb of God gave his life for the sins of the world. Is not this the glory of God? Can you see God's glory shining in the face of Jesus Christ? If you have, let it shine in your hearts. Christ's body was buried, fulfilling the scripture. It is important that the body that bore the sins of the world be buried so that a new body could rise in its stead, his resurrection body. That, G, that God raised him from the dead by the power of the Holy Spirit testifies to the effectiveness of his sacrifice. Our sins are put away. The validity of the scriptures depends on it. Our salvation depends on believing this truth, that Christ Jesus rose from the dead. Amen. Amen. And our rising from the dead depends on it also. 
God is fully satisfied in his blessed son and has set him on high at his right hand until his enemies are made his footstool. And he is satisfied with you as you remain in the Son. He is truly a blessed God, God blessed forever. Amen.